It has been another week of charting some unnavigated territory. How are you doing with all of the, the changes on a day-to-day -day basis that we all seem to be in the midst of? I hope you'll join me today for a conversation about how the church has done this across time and history. Good morning, Sugarloaf. What an awesome day to worship the King of Kings, Jesus. Let's sing this together. Oh, I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? He was my tomb. Till I met you yeah. I was breathing but not alive All oh, my failures I tried to hide It was my tune now, it was my tune Till I met Darkness into your glorious day. 
Father, we're so thankful for your grace, forgiveness, and love. We love you, Father. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes
Sugarloaf, my name is Jennifer Von Essen, and I am the Digital Church Director here at Sugarloaf UMC. I am here to fill you in on what's happening this month. In addition to this announcement video, we share all of our important information on our website through various social media platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and our weekly email newsletter, which you can subscribe to by visiting our website or by emailing us at info at sugarloaf.org. This week, we are beginning a two-week series titled Common Ground. You can join us in person on Sunday mornings at 9.30 for Chapel Sugarloaf or at 11 o'clock for our modern worship service. Or you can watch online on Facebook or our YouTube channel. If you are watching the service on Facebook, we have volunteers monitoring the chat each week. So feel free to engage with them during the service. Share your prayer requests and be a part of the conversation. Hey, chat volunteer. Thanks for being there on Sunday mornings. We appreciate your time and dedication. Sunday, October 31st, we are setting aside time to remember and honor those who have passed away in both our 9.30 a.m. chapel service and 11 a.m. modern service. We do this by sharing the names of those who have passed, lighting candles in recognition that the light of their spirit continues to burn. Everyone will have an opportunity to name their grief in community. Plan to be a part of this important day in the life of our church. Invite friends and family to be a part of this special day of remembrance. If you would like to honor someone in worship that day, please RSVP to terry at sugarloaf.org with the complete name of your loved one, indicating which worship service you'll be attending. We will have special seating reserved for you. This past year and a half has been difficult and challenging in a variety of ways. Whether you have experienced the death of a loved one, lost a relationship, a job, a home, or are struggling with anxiety in the uncertainty of our day, we want to provide a place to name our lament and pray for healing. As an act of solidarity with one another and with our community, all are invited to write a prayer to place in Sugarloaf's Wailing Wall, opening October 31st through November 21st. The Wailing Wall is a place to meet with God and offer prayers. It will be located at the main entry to the church. Thanksgiving is a special time for family and friends where we reflect on our blessings with gratitude. But there are others in our community who are struggling. We wanna be a blessing to those families this Thanksgiving. We will be collecting items for the Duluth Co-op now until the end of October. On your next grocery trip, you can pick up the items to put together a Thanksgiving bag for a family in need. The full list is located on our website. That's all I've got for you this week. So let's continue to worship together. Giving is an act of worship. When we give generously and sacrificially, it's not because God needs anything, but because we want to show our love for Him. Let's move into our time of giving as we pray together and bless this offering. God of great blessing, but even greater lessons, remind us again who gives life and who receives it. Sometimes, like Job, we need to have our questioning answered with a lesson. We need to learn that we are not the ones in charge in the universe. The gifts we bring this morning are not a down payment toward future favor, but a token of a debt we will never be able to repay. May we gain wisdom in the giving, and may these gifts be blessed for your glory not ours. In Christ we pray. Amen. Seize the 
be thrown into the midst of the sea. Thank you.
Hey everybody, Pastor Heather here. I'm excited to begin this two-part series we're calling Common Ground. I don't know about you, but I think there are a lot of new ground, new territory that we're having to kind of navigate together in the midst of a global pandemic, in the midst of a lot of, of social turmoil, political posturing, and all of the different things that we seem to be wrestling with um, at this point in our history. And yet there are places that God has set um, in our time and in our history for us to find common ground. This is not a new thing. The church has actually had to navigate this territory together in a variety of ways. And scripture has something to share with us about that. Today, we're looking at charting and navigating this new territory. I think it seems like the rules are changing on a daily basis as to how we can gather, when we can gather, what the rules are for us gathering together. Uh, uh, we've had to kind of navigate this territory as the church, certainly, but with our family, with our friends and our neighborhoods and our workplaces and our schools. Um, what does it mean to be the church in a time such as this? I think we've kind of been looking at that in a variety of ways, but I, I do believe that the, the book of Acts has something really specific to say to this um, territory that we find our in, ourselves in the midst of. I think we're being pushed to adapt so, to some new ways of being the church. Again, the church has had to find those new ways to be the church across time and history. If we just look at church history, if we look at Christian history, um, this is a season, this current situation that we find ourselves in. But I do believe that God is teaching us things if only we have eyes to see. Let's pray before we dig into God's word. Jesus, we just love you. We thank you. Uh, we are here for you. God, we, we all are struggling in a variety of ways to navigate this new time, this new world that we seem to find ourselves in the midst of. And yet you do not change, God. You do not change. Your scripture is constantly speaking to us. And so we pray as we open it today, Lord, that you would speak for your servants are listening. Holy Spirit, would you interpret these words for our lives today? It's in Christ's name that we pray it. And the church said, amen, amen. So how do you chart uncharted territory? Uh, what do you do when the maps that got you to where you are will not get you to where you need to go? Uh, I shared a couple of weeks ago about the fact that, you know, I think we're kind of trying to navigate as the church, we're trying to navigate our current reality in a Christendom mindset or a mindset that, that, that the world kind of wraps itself around um, our Christian values and, and ideals and beliefs, and yet the world around us does not. But we're, we're kind of using maps for, for New York City to, to navigate London, if you will. I think a really helpful a story or metaphor for this is uh, Lewis and Clark's expedition to explore the Louisiana Purchase. Now, Todd Bolsinger, who um, wrote on adaptive leadership, used this as a backdrop for his book called Canoeing the Mountains. And what he shares in that book is that uh, Lewis and Clark were, were um, really charged with finding this waterway to the Pacific uh, when they were exploring the, the Louisiana Purchase. And so they went and, you know, when you're going to find a waterway, you, you take those, um, those things with you to explore a waterway. So they brought canoes and all of the things to, to navigate water, to, to navigate that terrain. But what they found instead were mountains. They found mountains. And what they had to do at that point in time was it was a pivotal point in their decision making in their in their journey and what they were charged to do. Uh, and that was they had to decide, are we going to drag these canoes with us, these inherited forms of navigating this territory that we thought was in front of us? that looks very different than what was behind us or even what we thought was in front of us. Do we take those things with us and potentially hinder our progress? Or do we drop these things where they are and move on? Or do we just try to go back, go back and start all over again? 
I think that we find ourselves in the midst of a similar scenario as the church today. Do we take the things that we have that have gotten us to where we are into the future that looks so different from where we've come from? Do we turn around and start all over again? Or do we drop some of those things and move forward, trusting the leading and the guiding of God, the God that is with us wherever we are, whatever we might be doing? The good news is that while this territory that we're navigating right now is new to us, this is not new to the church across time and history, as I said. The scattering of God's people, much like we've we've experienced in the pandemic with our church buildings shutting down and us, you know, staying at home or staying away or, or meeting online or whatever. The scattering of God's people, distance and isolation are all common to the people of God in, across time and history. We see it in the, the exile and the exodus. There, there are so many um, places and spaces that, that the people of God have navigated this kind of territory today. And it's uh, similarly, we see this in the book of Acts in a variety of ways as the church um, comes to light, as the people of God adapt and change with this revelation of Christ, the Savior, the Messiah, uh, the, the Savior of the world. The birth of the church at, at Pentecost that we read of in the scripture, in the beginning of, of the book of Acts, uh, God's doing a new thing. God is doing a new thing. And, and the church in Antioch is now born out of uh, the, the uh, persecution. And we read about this in Acts chapter 11 and the dispersion of people because of, of, of the persecution of the people of God, uh, that God might call all people to God's self. So I want to give us a little bit of context for this. So if you want to turn with me um, in your Bibles to Acts chapter 11, uh, beginning at the 19th verse, I want you to hear this. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So some context for what we're talking about in this book of Acts, in this new territory that's being charted as the church is coming to life and these people that are not Jewish believers in Christ, but, but Gentile believers, people that were not formed um, like the people of God, the Jewish believers had been formed. Uh, that had been the very center point of who they were as a people. Gentile believers, these Greeks that we're told about in Acts chapter 11, were formed in very different ways by a very different culture uh, that, that surrounded them. And as a result, um, the Jewish believers were at first just sharing the gospel with other Jews. But these these others they kind of crossed that boundary line. Uh, you would say they kind, of, they kind of walked through the rubble of the walls that Jesus had taken down to the other side to share the good news because it was good and it was news and all people needed to hear it. All people needed to hear it. What's come before this is that, that Peter, who was a, a devout Jew and follower of Jesus, has this encounter with God where he's told that, that, that God makes no distinction between, um, between them, between the Jew or the Gentile, the Jew and the Greek. He's opened a way for all. This is the pervenient grace of God that we talk about with our, our Wesleyan roots. We, we recognize the hand of God, the, the work of God on our behalf through Jesus Christ, all people, all people that God would open that way for all of us through Jesus Christ. 
So God is speaking and moving in people outside that inner circle, that, that the people of God, the Jews, the Jewish believers um, in this case. And, and to be quite frank, if this did not happen, if this was not the reality of these people stepping across these, these boundary lines that Christ had eliminated, and yet we're still there in so many ways, if they had not stepped across those boundary lines, we wouldn't be where we are today. I mean, we're the Greeks, we're the, Jew, we're the, we're the Gentiles. These were the Jewish people that, that stepped across those lines that we might know the good news of Jesus Christ. And, and what we can also hear in this passage is that what Satan, what our enemy uh, intended for evil, God used for good. These people were being persecuted. These people were being scattered. They were being taken away from their, their community, their, their foundation, their, 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 their certainty, uh, their, their, in many ways, their identity. They were scattered. And yet at the same time, God used that for good, that others might not come to know the love and grace of God that had been made real in Christ Jesus. They couldn't keep that good news to themselves. They took to heart that the good news was good news for everyone, for everyone. And we're told in, in verse 23 there, when he came, he saw the grace of God. God was already working there. He wasn't bringing the grace of God there. The grace of God was already working there in the lives of those people. And God gave him the eyes to see that so that he might stay and spend time with them and invite Saul into that. And they spend a year there with these people who were the first called Christians at Antioch. So here's a question for you to consider. Who first spoke to you about the gospel? Who first spoke to you about the good news of God's saving love and grace through Christ Jesus? It's, it's an important thing for us to consider, to give thanks to God. Maybe you call them today and you thank them for, for stepping across whatever, uh, uh, maybe pride or, or thinking that they had to have all the right answers or, or you know being uncertain about how you would receive what they had to share with you. Who was that person who is that person for you? And who doesn't know the grace of God because you've been reluctant to share it? I think those are important things for us to reflect on as we encounter what God is doing in God's word today and how that can speak to where we are um, in this time, in this season as the church. Certainly as they encounter these, these people that have been formed in so many different ways and, and, and bringing the gospel to them, they had to adapt. They had to, they had to understand what it meant to be believers coming out of this different context. And it comes to a point where, um, they had to make some decisions about what the church moving forward would look like. The, the people of God, I should say, would look like moving forward from that. So we're going to pick up in, Acts chapter 15, where there's some question brought to who these people are, how they're practicing their faith, and what they have to ascribe to in order to follow Jesus. There are certain people that had issue or took issue with these Gentile or Greek believers following Jesus, like the Jewish people were following Jesus. So if you want to meet me at Acts chapter 15, I'm here in the first verse. And God's word says, certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers. Unless you're circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, <clears throat> you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. The news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers, who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider the question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them, Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, 
Why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. We are saved just as they are by grace, by the grace of God, they are saved just like us. So essentially what's happening here is these, these Jewish believers, these, these uh, religious authorities are, are questioning uh, the, the, the efficacy of the faith of the Gentile believers. And they're saying that they have to, in, in a sense, become Jews before they can become Christians or they have, to, they have to become Jews and ascribe to all of their laws and all of their customs before they can become followers of Jesus. And this is what's being brought into, into question here. And I wonder how do we do this today even? You know, people that um, maybe didn't come up in the church or, or, or people that live a different lifestyle than us. I mean, how much are we trying to tell them that they have to, to be just like us in all of the ways that we practice our faith or all of the things that, that we value before we will allow them to, to become Christians or follow Jesus like, like we do? How do we do this? Are we dispensers of this grace that, that is spoken to here in the scripture, because we have to lead with that, right? We have to lead with that. Jesus said uh, in, in the, the, the story that we're told in scripture where he encounters a sin, sinful woman, he tells her, um, you know, who, who, who condemns you and, and who has sinned? And, and she, he, he said, neither do I condemn you first, that grace, neither do I condemn you. And then he says, go and sin no more. He leads with the grace before he delivers the truth. And that's exactly what we're being asked to do here. He leads with the grace. He leads with the grace. He's telling us that the grace of God met him there. It was observable there. It was working there. And that the grace of God has met the Gentiles just as it met the Jewish believers. Are we dispensers of grace or referees of the rules? I think that's a question that we all have to ask ourselves. In other words, if you were a new believer and you ascribe to, to following Jesus and then all of a sudden you're, you're following after Jesus the best you know how to, and then people start telling you, well, well, wait, you've got to do this and you've got to do that and you have to behave this way and you have to believe this thing and then maybe you can follow Jesus. That would be problematic. How would you have felt about that? At the same time, we have to consider the other side of the coin how would these Jewish believers who had faithfully followed the law of Moses, who had ascribed to all of these uh, religious practices and ways of, of ruling their lives, and now they're being told, well, these other people, they don't have to do that. I mean, that's, that's a hard thing to come to terms with. It can be the grace of God can be quite an offensive thing. Uh, if we think that we have to earn it or deserve it and other people are just given it. The grace of God is, is far bigger than any rules. So I think there's really two things that we have to, to start with when we talk about common ground. And the first one is that, um, you know, we, we often call people that don't believe or, or behave like us um, sinners, right? But at the end of the day, the scripture tells us that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's common ground. We have all sinned. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us in need of redemption. That's common ground. But if we see people's sin before we see anything else, that becomes an obstacle between us, right? That become, becomes problematic. It, we're, we're told in scripture that, that, that Christ has removed the sin between us and God and between us and one another. He is our peace, we're told. Also in the book of Ephesians, he is our peace. He's removed the barriers, the barriers that have kept us from relationship with God and one another. And so often we put those barriers, those obstacles back up. Sin is one of them. If we lead with sin, that becomes problematic. It's the lens through which we see everything. And this is where we kind of have to remind ourselves, right? When we, when we go back to the beginning of the relationship between God and humankind, that God created us good. 
We were created in the image of God and we're told that we were very good. The penultimate part of God's creation, we were very good. It shifts how we respond to people when we remember that this person in front of me, whatever their, their sin that is so observable might be, or however their, 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 their far, their, their, their distance from God might be, um, that they're made in the image of God, that God made them very, very good. When we look at them uh, from a lens of, of Genesis 1 versus a, a lens of Genesis 3 and the fall and sin, right? Jesus came to redeem us and restore us to that Genesis 1 relationship. We have to look at all people the way God looks at them. That's the common ground that we share. And then the second is, is we have to consider how Jesus' form of holiness is often different from our ideas about holiness. I mean, this, this, these rules that the, the, the Jewish people, the Jewish law, the, the Mosaic law had the Jewish people follow were about holiness in relationship with God, a set apartness in relationship with God. But what was it about Jesus's form of holiness that caused people to flock to him? Caused people to flock to him. When oftentimes it seems that, that we in the church or, or followers of Jesus have the opposite effect on people around us. It's, it's really interesting for us to consider. It makes me very, very curious. I think often because we, we equate holiness with, with morality or, or uh, uh, moralism. Jesus was not afraid to, to get his hands dirty. I mean, we read again and again about how he, he ate with sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes. He wasn't afraid to touch the person who was sick, who no other priest would, would touch, right, for fear of being um, unclean. He touched those people. He wasn't uh, afraid of getting his hands dirty. He, he radically engaged with people on the margins of society. Our approach tends to fear getting dirty. Our approach tends to fear the other. Uh, we, we put up those fences, and, and at the same time, we prevent access to those people that God has made us to be in relationship with. Jesus allowed access to all kinds of people in all kinds of situations with all kinds of sin to touch him, to eat with him. He wasn't concerned about becoming unclean. Doesn't mean he condoned that behavior. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. It doesn't mean that he condoned it. If he condoned it, he would have said, neither do I condemn you. See ya. Keep living your life. He said, no, go and sin no more. His proximity didn't mean permission. But so many times we, we, get, we get so turned around in that, thinking that our proximity or our relationships with people that are far from God somehow um, connotate permission. There's a helpful, really, there's a helpful illustration for how we understand this. It's taken from social set theory around the ways that people gather and what holds them together. Um, and it's called bounded and centered set thinking. So I wanted to just kind of draw us a picture to help us better understand what we're talking about here. The church in, in Antioch in Jerusalem and this Jerusalem council meeting. And, um, and, and what we are encountering even as the church today and navigating kind of this uncharted territory. So as I said, this is uh, social set theory. And you may have heard of this before, but essentially the bounded set is kind of more of a, of a closed set thinking. So for our, for our sake, we'll say this is the bounded set and, and Jesus is here. So bounded set thinking really has some very clear walls around it and, and ideas about, let's, let's say these are, these are people, has very, very clear walls around it and, and ideas about who is in, inside those walls and who is outside those walls, who's outside those walls. Um, it, it really um, sets up a, a, a paradigm as to how we allow people to belong to us. And, and, and essentially it says that in order to belong to us in here, that you have to believe a particular way and behave a particular way, and then 
we will let you belong to us. So those are the clear walls, right? Belief and behavior speak to how we allow people to belong to us. Uh, essentially, you have to get all cleaned up, right? You have to believe exactly the same things that we believe, and then we'll let you inside. We'll let you inside the boundaries. This is what the, the religious authorities were saying here. Like, you have to practice all the same things we do. You have to believe the same things we do. And then we'll let you become a Christian or a follower of Jesus. Followers of Jesus. The, the Antioch believers, the Greek believers, were the first people that were called Christians. So we'll allow you to follow, follow Jesus with us if you believe like we do and behave like we do. Okay. Alternatively, um, centered set thinking... Again, putting Jesus at the center and the believers or, or the people seeking to the people seeking to follow Jesus um, around Jesus, centering around the, the person of Jesus, right? <clears throat> the, the, the boundary lines are different. It's really about the, the provenient grace of God. All are in the circle with Christ. And this is the provenient grace of God working. Every person on the planet is somewhere in relationship with God. We can agree on that, right? Every person on the planet is somewhere in this relationship with God. You could be sitting next to a person right now that's right here, or maybe even right here. But that person might be facing in this direction. You might have somebody here that is headed toward Jesus, facing toward Jesus. You might say, Heather, I've been this person, and I've been this person, and I've been this person, and I've been this person at different uh, times in my life and my relationship with God. But essentially all, all the provenient grace of God working in every person's life, um, it, it, that, that proximity is, is the difference. It doesn't mean these condoning behavior. It doesn't mean that there's permission being given for any particular thing. But the centered set thinking speaks to first belonging and then <clears throat> belief and behavior. Now, if we think about Jesus's life, I think it's important for us to, to consider a, a couple of things. Um, when Jesus called his disciples, to himself, when he called them on this, this journey of discipleship, of, of discovering who God was and how God was working and, and, and what he was inviting them to be a part of, he didn't tell them they had to believe a particular thing right off the bat. He just said, come follow me. He didn't tell them they had to behave a particular way. He first taught them how to belong to him. He first taught them how to belong to him. He spent night and day with them. They ate, they slept, they did all of the things together. They did the mountaintops, they did the valleys. They, they, they heard the, the, the words of, um, uh, of questioning that were brought to Jesus and they heard the accolades and the adoration and the worship. They, he was with them all along. He taught them first how to belong to him. Now we, we don't even know when we read the scripture, when we read the gospels, as to when any of the disciples believed, except for Peter, right? And his, his profession, his confession that Jesus says, you did not come to this of your own. The Holy Spirit revealed this to you. The Spirit, the Father revealed this to you. He's the only disciple that we know um, believed at that point in time. We have affirmation of that, right? Even after the, the death and resurrection, there are, are those that, that question at the ascension of Christ. We're told that the disciples are there and yet some of them doubted. Some of them doubted. And then finally, when we think about Peter uh, in the garden with Jesus and his arrest, he is far from behaving. He's cutting off the ears of people. So why is it that we, we operate out of this belief and behavior before we'll allow you to belong to us when this is far more uh, like the life of Christ and what he demonstrated in his own ministry? First, that grace, recognizing the image of God in the other and belonging to one another. God has given us to one another. And then the belief and the behavior. 
God has made us all to belong to him and to one another. There's a really helpful um, parable that missiologist Alan Hirsch shares um, to help us kind of, again, uh, understand what this looks like for us and how we navigate this uncharted territory as a church and as followers of Jesus that we find ourselves in, uh, in such a time as this. Uh, and the story is that there's a Japanese tourist that comes to the outback, the Australian outback. Um, Alan Hirsch is an, is, a, is an Australian. And so um, he comes to the Australian outback and he sees all of these sheep and they're just wandering all over the landscape, hundreds and hundreds of sheep. And the Japanese tourist is, is perplexed and says, where are your fences? How do you keep your sheep together? And the, the farmer says, we don't need to have fences. We just dig really deep wells and those sheep will not wander far. They come back to that water. Just as we're called, just as Paul planted the gospel in different places, we're called to plant the gospel to share who Jesus is, and people will not wander far from that. We don't have to put up hard boundaries as to who is in and who is out, who belongs and who does not. There's a world of people looking for belonging, a world of people looking for belonging. They don't know that they belong to the God of heaven and earth. How can we invite them in to that family of belonging? Where can we find common ground, the image of God and the person across the street or across the table or across the school or across the office or across the world? How can we remember the image of God that's, that's there and the sin that, that we all share, that we've all fallen short of the glory of God? Where might God be calling us to dig wells? in our own neighborhoods, in our own networks? Where will we eagerly share about this good news that is good and still news to so many? We eagerly share so many things in our lives. Our next favorite restaurant that we just ate at or the great cup of coffee we drank or, or maybe great music. But how about our great God, this common ground that we all share? and God's love and grace and the good news that is good and is news. It has never been more important right now than to keep the church strong in this season. And it is a season, it is a season, but it's one where we have the opportunity to recognize the hand of God that is working all around us even in our scattering, even in our isolation, even in the, the things that seemingly seem to, to, to separate us. The gates of hell, we're told, cannot prevail against this God's church. So we're invited into that place of grace. How will you live into this new uncharted territory that God's inviting us to be a part of? How will we as a church live into this uncharted territory together? How will we invite people to feel like they belong to that God of heaven and earth? Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you for this grace. Thank you for, for showing us that we do belong to you, for going to every height and depth and breadth that we might be returned to the very, very good image that we were created in. Jesus, help us to see that image reflected in the, the faces of, of all of those that we encounter here and, and in our community and in the wider world. Help us to re be reminded of, of the places that you have brought us together, what we share in common that is so much greater than what divides us. We thank you for this grace. We thank you for this love. And we pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen, amen. Look forward to sharing part two of our Common Ground conversation next week. Y'all have a great week.